why do I always end up around the edge of the city in December and January? I associate this area with being freezing cold and it being a kind of gloomy, cloudy day like today, which is the perfect weather for the walk I've got for you today. I'm so excited about this walk because we're going to link together a series of really intriguing locations with great stories to tell. This is really the best type of walk in many ways. Obviously, I say that, don't I? Like, I love my river walks. I love all walks, really. But there's something about unlocking the secrets of the city, which is just magical. And there's something about the city fringe, the nature of it, the stories it contains, which is really potent and, and really resonant because of the things that were pushed outside the city walls. Here we're walking north of Liverpool Street into once what would have been Fenland and Marshland, where the, the River Walbrook rises, a place of dissenters and outlaws and outcasts, a place of pleasure and play. And these are all things we'll be encountering today. But our first destination is a place of great poets and dissenters. We're going to go to Bunhill Fields, final resting place of William Blake and near where Milton wrote Paradise Lost. So here is Finsbury Barracks, home of the uh, Honourable Artillery Company and the Royal London Militia as well. So of course, I suppose there has to be a, an army garrison to protect the city of London. And despite its kind of medieval appearance, I think it was uh, finished in the 1850s and parts of it, uh, the older parts of it were commissioned, I think in the middle of the uh, 18th century. So it was sort of built around a hundred year period. They've got quite impressive grounds behind there, actually. I worked in there once on a, on a catering job 25, more than 25 years ago, 28, 29 years ago. Uh, impressive place. And this street, Moorgate here, literally was the city gate that led out to the Fenland. Very marshy, boggy area. And the edge of the known city beyond that was just the, was the wilds and then the hills up to Islington. What's interesting is that the original stone gatehouse was taken down in the 18th century and the stones were used to reinforce London Bridge, which they thought was about to be swept away by the tides of the Thames. And just next to Finsbury Barracks, we have a, one of the most storied places in London. Bunhill Field Cemetery. The name Bunhill in Bunhill Fields is said to derive from Bone Hill, Bone Hill Fields. When bones from the, the churchyard at St Paul's were moved here in the 16th century, it actually existed as one of the principal fields in the old manor of Finsbury. And it's believed that there were burials here dating back a thousand years. That it's an ancient burial site. So it's something special. It's known as being one of the sort of resonant locations in London. Ian Sinclair calls it a nodule of energy. And it's the information they have here, they claim that it's one of the most celebrated burial places in the whole country because of the amount of religious nonconformists that are buried here. You've got Defoe, Blake. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church and the Methodist Mission that Wesley founded on City Road is nearby. You've got Quaker Gardens nearby as well. So for religious nonconformists of all sort of colours and hues, this is a really important location. Here's a wonderful little spot that would be hard to match anywhere else in London, I would say, beyond maybe Westminster Abbey. On the left, the obelisk has been raised to mark the burial place of Daniel Defoe. 
who actually wrote about Bunhill Fields in his book, uh, Journal of a Plague Year, uh, documents the, an outbreak of plague in London, which is quite, <laughs> quite apt for the current situation, I guess. And he, he talked about people dressed in rags, suffering from the plague, rushing around the streets and throwing themselves into graves in Bunhill Fields. And it's believed that many plague victims were buried here. And next to Defoe is uh, a stone to mark the resting place of William Blake, the great painter and poet, William Blake, the visionary of London. I'm not sure if his uh, bones are actually buried right here, but it's a marking site nearby where Blake is said to rest. And Blake is buried here with his wife, Catherine. There's usually flowers and other things that people have, have left because Blake is a revered figure, particularly in London. But there are other sites associated with Blake around the city that people tend to gravitate to. He was buried in 1827. On the way here today, actually, I bumped into the great, the great painter Bob and Roberta Smith, RA, Royal Academician. <laughs> And I'll put a link below to the documentary I made about Bob. Um, you know, Bob's a significant, uh, a significant contemporary British artist. Professor Patrick Brill is his real name. And I said to Bob, I said, I'm coming to Bunhill Fields. Really, in reality, what's the big stiff about Blake? Being slightly uh, iconoclastic and irreverent, as I tend to try to be occasionally, we hold these figures up. I think, what makes them objectively great? Yes. Blake was a visionary and he wrote some incredible poems and he had great visions of London, like he saw pillars of gold and the plains beneath the hills of Islington in his wonderful poem, Jerusalem in Jerusalem, really the de facto, uh, the real kind of, many people consider it the real national anthem of England, a great vision. Um, and of course, you know, famous for seeing angels on Peckham Rye. And there's amazing paintings that you can see in the Tate Gallery, incredible, incredible paintings. But and Bob said, well, look, you know, the great thing about Blake was he wasn't, he wasn't one of those kind of posh dilettantes that was funded by family wealth. He was a working man. Blake was a printer and he was a wonderful artisan, a wonderful craftsman, as well as being a brilliant artist and an incredible visionary poet. He's one of the real um, powerful spirits of London. Here's the tomb of John Bunyan, author of The Pilgrim's Progress. He was buried here in 1688 at the age of 60 years old. So I believe the presence of Blake and Defoe in the churchyard yeah, it made that pub there, the Artillery Arms, a little bit of a kind of magnet for poets. I think there may have been poetry events there in the past and, and book launches and all sorts. I think Ian Sinclair's done some stuff in there back, back in the day when he was, uh, had a small press publishing poetry. So we come out onto Bunhill Row. So it's in this street here that Milton lived from, I'll put the dates on the screen, it's something like 1660 something to 1674. It's here, whilst living here, that he wrote Paradise Lost. And he also wrote um, Paradise Regained. And one other book as well. So there must have been some, something special about this area that inspired such incredible works of poetry. Old Street, one of the great thoroughfares of London. Down there we see that curious structure. That's what's known as the Silicon Roundabout due to the cluster of tech companies around this area. Although I think that may be changing. And I guess the names are a bit of a giveaway. Although it's only sort of, I think the first recorded mention of Old Street is around 1200 
it's firmly believed that it follows more or less the route of a much older trackway, possibly even pre-Roman trackway. There was a Roman road that, that went around the edge of the city wall and linked uh, Silchester to Colchester. So it's an intriguing idea that it marks a pre-Roman trackway, possibly linking the same two sites because Colchester was a very important Iron Age city. Iron Munger Row Baths, we'll have to take that in on our route. And here we have one of the most resonant locations in the area, St Luke's Church, Old Street. A really majestic building, which has taken on a completely different hue given that it was designed by the great architect Nicholas Hawksmoor. And people such as Ian Sinclair have claimed that Hawksmoor dabbled in esoteric beliefs. Some people have even connected him to the occult and claimed that his churches form a kind of pentagram if you draw lines between them and perhaps are placed along ley lines or lines of energy that run beneath the surface of the city. Ian mentions uh, Hawksmoor in, a, in, a, in Lud Heat, in his great poetic work, Lud Heat, and then Peter Ackroyd took that idea even further and wrote a novel called Hawksmoor. Hawksmoor worked closely with Christopher Wren. He worked on St Paul's Cathedral. He also worked on um, Blenheim Palace and worked on a number of uh, Wren's city churches. He really did leave a, a very strong mark on the city. Now St Luke's is home to the London Symphony Orchestra. It stopped being a church, I think, in the 1950s. So the proximity of St Luke's the burial place of William Blake has made this a real, really important kind of triangle for psychodrographers, for British psychodrographers. They love this bit around here. You might be saying, hang on a moment, aren't you a psychodrographer? Of course I am. Um, but I feel like that's, that's somebody else's riff. That's the brilliant, amazing Ian Sinclair. He gave us the great gift of this mythology of London, linking these sites together, what he calls nodules of energy. And I was really fortunate a few years ago, a few years ago, I think it was 2004, and I came to a, a talk that um, Ian Sinclair did in St Luke's Church with Will Self. And that's where I heard Ian talking about Blake's burial place linked to the church and a number of other sites in the area to, to create this really, what he saw as a very powerful source of stories, if nothing else, right? a generator of myths of the city. And we need these stories. You might be thinking ley lines, esoteric secrets buried in architecture. What a load of woo. Maybe, but it's good stories, aren't they? They make your walk around the city a bit more interesting when you engage with it on that level, when you imagine these things and allow your mind to, to run riot. Why not? Just over the road from St Luke's you have White Cross Street Market which is uh, home to a fantastic food market. It's really buzzing during the war. <laughs> I say that, I haven't been to the market since the, since the pandemic began but certainly before that, lunchtime's during the week. A great place to go and get street food. I think the world champion barista has a stall there I believe or certainly a guy who's won it a few times. It's a really wonderful place. Today is a Saturday afternoon, so it's very quiet at the moment. And just behind St Luke's Church, you have the majestic Iron Munger Row Baths, which is a really wonderful public baths. It did open in 1931 as a public bathhouse. We could go for, literally go for there for a bath. And then they upgraded it to be a, a Turkish bath. I think there still are Turkish baths there, I believe. We used to use that pool. Uh, when we lived at the Angels, where they used to do baby swim lessons. For, you know, it's where my eldest son learned to swim in there when he was a wee baby. It's a really beautiful institution. Because of course, this was, a, this was and still is a very working class area. So a lot of people didn't have baths in their houses. You'd have to come to a public bath like this one. What's interesting about the location of Ironmonger Row Baths as a public bathhouse is that historically there were other public baths 
in this area, places for public bathing. And we're going to go to one of the sites of those now. It's, his history is recorded in a street name where you might not necessarily know what it related to. And we're going to see that just up here. So here we have quite a sort of nondescript looking street. There's not really a lot here, is there? This is Peerless Street, which takes its name from an old pond that was here. It was originally known as Perilous Pond due to the fact that people would go swimming in there and dive in the waters and drown. I think it was a very deep pond. There was also a spring here that supplied drinking water to the people of the city where it was fed along wooden pipes. And then they rebranded it in a way as a place for, for duck hunting. So it was in the early 17th century that it became um, used for duck hunting and it was the quote says let your boy lead his water spaniel along and we'll show you the bravest sport at Parlous Pool. So at that point it was still Parlous Pool. It wasn't until they um, you know sort of started to advertise it as a sort of resort that it became peerless which I love that. This is from um, Streams, Springs and Spas of London by uh, Alfred Ford. And it was around that time that when it was reopened as a, as a place for bathing, a bathing pool, an open air cold bath was, was constructed here. That it was then called Peerless Pool. And it was advertised as that, as Peerless Pool because it has no peers. The water is so clean and fresh. What I love is uh, in 1790 describing it where it, when it become a covered bath, a real place to come for the a day out at the, uh, the cold water baths and it was described as not only having covered baths but also a library amongst the amusements that were advertised which is really lovely isn't it come for a swim and whatever else you would do here and then also read a book <laughs> why don't you come and put your feet up and read a book after you've been to the cold water baths really delightful we've got one more place i really want to show you as part of this walk and I warn you now I'm probably going to have to sing I can't see a way around it some of the eagle-eyed amongst you would have noted that we're walking around the side of Moorfields Eye Hospital which uh, is a very important part of London's health infrastructure <laughs> so this pub here the old fountain which I think we're still in Peerless Street. I wonder if that has any association with the baths and the, and the spring that was here. Could well do, couldn't it? And we've come out now onto City Road, another of the great thoroughfares of the city. That's two in a day, what's going on? This one heads north up to Islington, out of the city, up to the Angel Islington. I don't know exactly how old the city road is, but it's certainly of a certain vintage. It's, yeah, a lot of the, the buildings along here date from the 18th century, and I would imagine it's much older than that even still. And a great road, a road of stories, a road of secrets. Well, we're looking for one particular location here. Many of you will already have guessed. By the way, if you've not been along City Road for a few years, it's changed quite a lot, as you'll have seen from some of this footage. There's a number of massive buildings that go pretty much quite along the way up City Road as far as the uh, the City Road basin on the canal. There's some great big enormous buildings. From that point on it's a bit more familiar but you'll get a bit of a shock the first time you come up here if you've not been here for like I don't know about 10 years maybe. Up and down the city road, just there. In and out the eagle, that's the way the money goes. Pop goes the weasel. I'll do it again in case you missed the significance. Up and down the city road, city road. In and out the eagle, that's the way the money goes. Pop goes the weasel. And they actually have those words on the side of the pub. So the famous nursery rhyme, Pop goes the weasel, mentions this pub. I'm not saying it's about this pub. I think the origin 
of that song is about the number of resorts and entertainments there were on the northern edge of the city. The streets and the hills of Islington were littered with these kind of resorts. Uh, that nursery rhyme, I think, is at least 18th century. So there were a number of pleasure gardens around Islington, around the, the lower slopes. This would have been the beginning of it, actually, just outside the city, but there were loads more up in Islington. I'll link below to a video where I talk about some of those sites and visit some of them, particularly around the Angel as well. And that was the thing, it was the city clerk's day out, was to head up the city road into Islington and spend all their money. Pop goes the weasel being, that's all your money blown. And they'd be back to work to earn some more before you could come blow it again going up and down the city road and in and out the eagle. Isn't it lovely? And what I love about that is that nursery rhyme has gone all around the world and it's, there's different versions of it. I know in the United States there's a, there's a slightly different wording because the city road wouldn't mean anything, nor would the eagle. But it all originates from here. There you go. And I think that is the perfect note to end this little walk on. Not an epic, of course not, but I love doing little walks like this. This is the kind of thing that I did when I first started really getting deep into my London studies, just linking together a few locations and trying to see whether they did in fact link together and trying to get a portrait of the area from these few resonant locations. So I hope you enjoyed that walk. I hope you have a great Christmas. Of course, I won't make, upload another video until Boxing Day. So I hope you have a fantastic Christmas, however you celebrate, whatever you celebrate, whether you celebrate Christmas or Yuletide or Saturnalia, whether you go to a temple of Mithras and perform the rites of Mithras. Does anyone still do that? I don't know. But whatever you're doing, I hope you have a cracking one. And well, I'll see you on the other side of Christmas anyway. Take care. And how could I forget to say, and I look forward to seeing you on the next walk, wherever that may be. It'll be amazing wherever it is. And the one after that will be 2022. That's the future. Mm -hmm.